Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we take a look back to June 1983 and find out all the news and latest game releases. We follow the evolution of the joystick interface. We check out some early software project games and take a look at some newer titles. But first it's back into our time machine and June 1983. Sinclair Research are to set up an advanced research centre to explore new areas of technology. The centre, starting up with a £2 million backing from Sinclair, will be based in Cambridge and be given the name MetaLab. Clive Sinclair said the centre would look into future technologies and such things like batteries and robotics. Keeping with Clive Sinclair, and he's been awarded a knighthood in the Queen's birthday honours. He said it was completely unexpected and a wonderful surprise. At 42, he is said to be the founder of the world's largest volume manufacturer of personal computers. With this success, his new project is a flat screen TV, after which he plans to take a look at an electric car and a personal robot. An argument has broken out between two software companies about the name of a game. Both Cade and Argus Press have been advertising a game called The Valley, and both sides are firing counterclaims. Argus Press claimed that the Cade version is nothing more than a typing game that featured in Computing Today in 1982, while Cade responded by claiming that their version is in fact a conversion of one of their original games, also called The Valley, released in summer 1982 for the VIC-20. As the row continues it seems Cade has renamed its game to The Swamp, but refused to withdraw it from sale. Argus are demanding its withdrawal and legal advice is being sought. This isn't the first time the game has been surrounded by controversy. Recently CRL had been contacted by Argos, asking them to withdraw their game The Orb, as this was basically a renamed version of their game. CRL quickly withdrew the game and paid Argos what was called a substantial sum of money. And now on to the top selling games. Penetrator and The Hobbit are still in the top 10, but finally get challenged for the top spot by a new software company making big waves. Ultimate Play the Game released their first two titles, with Jetpack entering straight into the top five. Other games making headway this month include R Diddums. Following on from Arcadia, this toy box game from Imagine had some cute, if flickery, graphics. Next is Planet of Death, a 16K text adventure from Arctic Computing. And finally, Football Manager, a strategy game that allows you to build a football team and take them all the way to the top. And that's it for June 1983. For what predominantly ended up as a gaming machine, the ZX Spectrum, when launched in 1983, didn't have a joystick interface. This was mainly down to the fact that Sinclair wanted to pitch the machine as a direct competitor to the BBC Micro and take a share of the lucrative education and business market. For the early gamers though, the only way to play games was via the rubber, dead flesh keyboard, which many loved and many hated. Early games tended to use the keys Sinclair had thoughtfully placed as cursor keys and had little direction arrows above them. Sadly though, this layout didn't exactly lend itself to good gameplay. Soon games began to use more comfortable keys, or even let you define your own. Most common of these was Q, A, O, P and Space. For many gamers this layout is still the preferred layout, myself included. It wasn't long before companies realised that the rapid influx of games for a machine without an actual joystick was money waiting to be made. From this moment on, the race was on to create an industry standard. Early attempts included plastic clip-on sticks that covered the cursor keys and had mechanical movement inside, or larger clip-on keyboard overlays, none of which really fixed the problem. Next came a rash of hardware interfaces that plugged into the back of the Spectrum and came with a variety of different standards. Some emulated the cursor keys, some used the Sinclair option, which confusingly still used the number keys but in a different layout. Other companies headed down a more flexible but more expensive route of the programmable interface. These ranged from having plug-in cards that had special codes on them, or wires and plugs that the user could decide which key was for which direction and plug in the corresponding wire. 
Some companies even introduced their own standard. The major one was Kempston. At the time it was released, practically no game supported it, but the big selling point was the ability to add joystick controls to your own basic programs. The Kempston interface used the IN commands for directional control, making it easy to implement for many games companies. And soon Kempston themselves were releasing compatibility tapes that allowed older games to be used with their new standard. Because of this it wasn't very long that Kempston became the de facto standard, but it still didn't get round the issue of older games. Next came the dual joystick interface, an interface that had two connectors and allowed you to switch between two different standards. But again, that only covered two standards. Kempston then released a three socket interface, which supported three standards, nearly all bases covered there. As time went on, production costs came down, and as this happened, there was no real barrier into actually creating an interface. The next step then was to cram a Kempston interface into any other interface that could, that could plug into the spectrum. This included sound interfaces, backup interfaces, speech interfaces. All of them suddenly wanted to have a Kempston joystick as part of their product. With all these interfaces being produced, Kempston became the standard, and us gamers never looked back. Released in 1983, Thruster was one of the first batch of games produced by the Liverpool-based software house, most famous for Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy. The early games included Mackenzie, Omitron, Orion and Pushoff, but for me Thruster was probably the best and most original. The game sees you controlling a low-powered spaceship out to destroy aliens in their nest before they can grow up and pose a threat to some civilization or other. The aircraft can shoot the nest guards, but not the aliens themselves. Who on earth sent a ship like that to tackle such a mission? Probably against some health and safety regulations somewhere, but hey. The way you have to destroy the aliens instead of shooting them is to push a large rock off ledges so that it lands on top of the aliens. The guards move about randomly and the aliens move in several different patterns, sometimes venturing up to the top levels making it difficult because you can't actually shoot them. You have to wait until they move out of the way and you can drop a rock on them. The guards and aliens change per level keeping the game fresh and the challenge is consistent throughout. The sound is good and the graphics are large and colourful. With careful planning you can kill three or four aliens at the same time on some levels, whereas some levels require the rock to be moved in certain places just to kill the last one, which can get a bit tedious. The game is fun to play and can suddenly shift from calculated rock dropping to hectic shooting very quickly. The only thing that I didn't like was the laser, which often missed the guards despite blatantly hitting them three or four times. This often led to you dying for no apparent reason. In my opinion then, this is the best of the early bunch and well worth checking out. Also a part of that initial release was Orion. This maze game is simple once you find out what does what, and eventually proves quite challenging and enjoyable. The idea is that you have to rescue stolen androids from an underground maze while avoiding the Dark Horde. Green guards patrol the screen randomly and must be avoided or killed using your shield. You do this by triggering your shield just as you make contact with them. You have a limited amount of power in your shield, but this soon builds up quite quickly, but nevertheless you still need to keep an eye on it. There are also other white creatures in the maze that when collected give you extra points, but at the same time break your scanners, causing the maze to partially vanish. This means you have to guess or remember the routes around the maze. If you save one of the androids after directly collecting one of the white creatures, the scanners are repaired and you can see where you're going again. But if you collect two of the white aliens straight after each other, you will destroy your ship. It sounds a little complex, but as soon as you get used to it, you'll find yourself running around from room to room quite happily. The graphics are large, but moving character jumps, so are obviously a little jerky. The control panel often flickers too, especially when there's a lot going on on screen, which can sometimes distract. The sound is very good, except when you jump from room to room, when there's a rather annoying inter-room sequence that you have to sit through every time. 
Overall though, this is a nice little game to try, but certainly not one of Software Project's best games. Alter Ego. I don't know how to explain this game other than it's an addictive platform collect em up with great gameplay and a novel twist. You control what is described as a hero, but what actually looks like a tiny man with a box on his head. He has to collect dots placed on various platforms and avoid contact with some bouncy one legged skulls that patrol the aforementioned platforms in set routes. What makes this game different though is the fact that you have a twin on screen at the same time. This twin can't be killed, neither can he collect your dots. You can switch places with him a limited number of times on each level, in order to avoid bouncy monsters or to collect dots that are not accessible from your current position. Later levels include dots that only your twin can collect, adding more of a challenge. You can fall from any height, but not into the water at the bottom of the screen. Each level is a puzzle in itself as you work out the best route and the best use of your jumps as they're called to make sure that you collect all of the dots. This is a real brain teaser of a game and if this looks like the kind of game that you would like I can highly recommend it. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.